We have Rachel Butler joining us. She's worked for the BBC's Natural History Unit for uh, over 10 years now, traveling the world to reveal little known animal behaviors. Her recent stories and series have included Great Barrier Reef, Shark, and Blue Planet 2. Um, Rachel is a legend. She introduced me to fish finger sandwiches when I visited uh, the BBC Natural History Unit a little while ago, so it changed my life. So Rachel, it's so great to have you joining us live here today. Um, and we can't wait to dive into some of your stories. Thank you so much for the intro, Joe, and for hosting me today. It's so exciting on Global Biodiversity Day. Mm. And what a better topic than to think about the world's oceans, because we get a plethora of amazing life beyond our waves that we normally see just from looking out of our window on the coast. And it's really hard for me to think about how I'm going to kind of try and cram as much of that excitement into 20 minutes as possible. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you and start right away. Okay, can you see that all right? Yep, looks good. Fantastic. So as Joe says, I'm a wildlife filmmaker. I'm a producer and director with the BBC's Natural History Unit. And I'm currently in lockdown in my lounge in Bristol. But when I'm at work, I'm normally in a wetsuit and diving gear like here on the left. This is off the coast of Japan, uh, filming for Blue Planet 2. Um, but because it's Global Biodiversity Day, I wanted to tell you first a little bit about one of my favorite groups of animals, which are the sharks. And the reason I wanted to talk about sharks is that they're keystone species. And so it's really important that we preserve them because if you preserve a keystone species, then you also help to conserve the myriad of other animals that live within its habitat. Um, so I spent three years making a series all about sharks, which was a surprise because if you'd have said that to me a few years before, I wouldn't have believed you. And I would never have believed I've been able to do this because I was so terrified of them. So what we actually found was that the, the perception that I had of sharks before I started working on that series was, like many people's, that they are scary, they're full of teeth, and they're dangerous animals that, that you know, just have one thing in their mind, and that's food. When in actuality, they're an incredible group of animals. The juveniles can be really vulnerable. The mothers can be really careful and really tend to their eggs in a really delicate way. They have social networks. They have a kind of secret language with one another. And some of them, like this one here, the whale shark, eats nothing but plankton. They're also, when we're celebrating their diversity, an incredibly diverse group of animals. You get some that are 60 foot, like this whale shark, and you get some that are just six inches, the dwarf lantern shark that could fit in your hand. So they're an absolutely incredible group of animals and really important uh, when we're thinking about conservation. Um, because we don't have too long, um, I couldn't not talk about the latest series that I worked on, which was Blue Planet 2. Um, it was an amazing series. We spent uh, four years making it. We traveled to over 125 countries all around the world. We spent about 6,000 hours underwater and about 1,000 hours in submarines. And um, our aim on the series was to really celebrate the awe and wonder of our blue planet and of the diversity within it, um, but to also kind of look more at those individual creatures and to really show the intelligence and sophistication of some of the animals. So I wanted to introduce you to uh, one of my favorite characters from the series. This is Percy. He's a little tusk fish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Uh, we work with scientists all the time when we're filming and uh, one scientist, Dr. Alex Vail on the Great Barrier Reef, found and named Percy. He called him Percy because he's very persistent and tenacious. It's a persistent Percy. And uh, we thought he was a great character because he really kind of, again, goes against the normal preconception that you might have a fish, that they have 10 second memories and they're slippery and they're really not that intelligent. But um, as I think you'll discover in this next short clip, uh, Percy's actually quite a wonder.
<laughs> little persistent Percy there. Um, I was amazed time after time when we were filming for this series, just how incredible, how diverse, but also how sophisticated these animals are. We filmed um, an octopus that hid itself from predators by gathering shells and hiding under armor. We filmed um, a trout that hunted cooperatively with an octopus. We filmed two different cetacean species that meet up and hunt together and they recognize each other by name and by call as well. So really unbelievable. Um, but to film these animals, it takes a long time and it takes some pretty specialist kit. Uh, myself and my researcher, Yoli Bozaga, went out with Roger Munns, the cameraman, to film this. And uh, we spent about 100 hours with Alex trying to find Percy and film him. So uh, it does take some doing. We filmed Percy and some of the other animals in our reef film by using a kit like this, um, this straight scope here. Um, and so you can really get that honey, I shrunk the kids type look. You can see my colleague Dan there is wearing a rebreather, which allows you to stay underwater for about three or four hours at a time and produce no bubbles. So you can get really close to the animals. Uh, we also used a variety of other kit to get some pretty novel shots and tell new stories. This was the Mega Dome. It was a 24 inch dome and we used it all over the world to uh, try and get 50-50 shots of animals such as uh, the walrus because of course walrus and icebergs, they, uh, the walrus live on top of the iceberg in the summer months and um, about seven eighths of the iceberg is actually underwater. So to tell the full story, you have to get that kind of 50-50 approach. Um, but it wasn't always camera operatives, our humans that were filming for us on the series. Uh, sometimes we asked the animals to film for us. So in this next clip I'm going to show, we actually um, attached some suction cup cameras onto the back of Orca. Uh, we did this hand in hand with scientists and we worked on, we did this uh, technique a few times throughout the series. And um, I should say actually that without these scientists and the incredible work that so many conservation heroes and, and biologists are doing in the field, we would never know about half the animals that we are able to ultimately film. And so these little um, camera tags, there is a plethora of other scientific data included within, within the tags, such as hydrophones and depth data and salinity data. So when we managed to suck it up, Such a wonderful shoot and a wonderful part of the world there, Norway, to, to have worked in. Um, now I could I could share so many more stories, but um, we couldn't really talk about biodiversity without talking about habitat destruction and uh, some of the problems that the oceans are facing. And so where you saw Percy earlier on, the Great Barrier Reef, the last few years, this year included, it's had some of the worst coral bleaching events ever on record. The sharks, like we were talking about at the very start, of course, sharks are caught in their millions for, uh, for the shark fin trade. And um, whales here, I mean, whales are in trouble because of noise pollution, also because of contaminants in the water. Um, be very interesting at the moment to see how much less of that and how much less noise pollution there could be with that, with the lockdown we're all facing. Um, but we see this again and again and again on, on the shoots and, and we see the effects of it as we're filming. And um, it's really, it's, there's, there's all kinds of plastic pollution. You know, we saw a lot of plastic pollution in, in Blue Planet 2. On every single one of those shoots that I talked about, we found bits of plastic, even in the Arctic, kind of frozen into the Arctic ice. Um, but there is a lot we can do. The reason that I showed that last clip was because um, of the International Whaling Moratorium in 1986. They're seeing huge numbers of whales in the fjords of Norway again, and they simply weren't seeing that many years ago. And that's in part because the herring stocks are doing so well. So if we manage fish stocks well, and if we have protection in place for these animals, then they can bounce back. Um, about 8 million tons of plastic is put into the oceans every year as well and uh, and on Blue Planet 2 when that was seen around the country here in Britain it did cause people to use a lot less single-use plastic and that's something that we can all do because it's a very tangible thing um, and with global warming I hope that if we only learn one thing from lockdown it's that 
we can have Zoom conferences and we can talk to our colleagues on the phone and we can work, you know, electronically. We don't have to always be flying and traveling all over the globe to do our business. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Joe, for hosting me. And uh, I hope those few stories do, do, do the ocean biodiversity a, a small amount of justice. <laughs> Oh, I think you picked some amazing stories uh, to share with us today, Rachel. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those stories. Um, wow, the places that you get to visit, uh, the sequences that come together, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think it's worth just kind of sharing quickly. You know, let's think of, the, of Percy, Percy doing his thing. How long did it take to get that sequence? Well, Alex, the, the scientist we were working with, um, spent many many hours kind of looking for Percy and finding an anvil site that that worked because there were other fish other little Percy's but they would maybe go into an area of more denser coral whereas Percy came back to the same as as David calls it the same kitchen spot which was perfect for filming because we were able to kind of really get there and not damage any coral and and be able to film it from every possible angle but when Roger and Yoli and I arrived on location with Alex it took about about 100 hours to, to film that one sequence. Yeah, a lot of sitting and waiting and doing nothing. <laughs> All right, but I mean, look at the final product. So definitely worth it. Um, so a reminder to everybody tuning in live, we have Slido rooms for every event. So a Slido room is basically just a spot where you can come in, put in a question, get it upvoted to the top. You can find all of the rooms under the speakers uh, category on the, on the website. Uh, you can find all those rooms there. And Rachel, we do have some questions coming in here um, via the, um, the, the, the Slido. So Alicia's our first one and she's curious, uh, spe spending so many hours in the water with sharks filming a series like Shark, were there ever any uh, incidents, any close calls? That's a really good question. Um, and uh, there were a few close calls, but they weren't with sharks. So, you know, I thought working on a series like this that, uh, you know, the number one on my risk assessment every time we went out would be sharks, but it was actually often things like, you know, being at depth for too long, you get the risk of the bends, diving under ice, you know, you, you can get, you can get trapped under the ice if you're not careful. So, you know, we had, we had a, a uh, not nothing serious, but we, we had a few small issues like uh, people dropping kit or hurting their back or getting, you know, exhausted or heat stroke on location, but, um, but no incidents with sharks at all. And of those 500 species, only a handful of them are ever responsible for fatalities. And even then, you know, there's this crazy statistics like you're more likely to die from a coconut falling on your head and domestic dogs and hippopotamuses are, are much more deadly than, than sharks. So I think they get pretty bad rep. I couldn't agree more. I love the way you answered that question. I mean, toasters and vending machines are more, yeah. <laughs> more dangerous than sharks. So uh, I think that's something to think about. Uh, I love your t-shirt, by the way, Joe. How oh, many yeah. species are, uh, are in that one? Maybe all five, no, probably not all 500, maybe close. Maybe. A lot. <laughs> Very cool. They're uh, just so misunderstood. I think that's the same thing. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, okay, let's jump in and grab another question from the Slido room. Uh, this time is about, um, yeah, sharks is a very popular topic here, but uh, yeah, they're wondering. Oh, here we go. I think this is a fun one. Uh, what does the future of underwater filming technology look like? Is there anything really neat coming down the pipeline that, that gets you excited or does it all have to be kept really quiet? Well, I mean, we're always developing secret kit at the BBC to try and, you know, get you an angle or a view that you've never seen before to kind of, yeah. it's all about the stories though. So if we can find a new piece of kit that will allow us to kind of tell a new story, that's really exciting. But I mean, of course, there's, there's huge revelations in technology. I mean, just look at our smartphones, you know, just 10 years ago, we had little Nokia things and now you can basically run your world in the palm of your hand. So 
Um, I think rebreather technology is a big one. You know, we're just able to spend so much more time underwater, which is really key and be silent with no bubbles. So you can really try and get under the skin of an animal and really try and break down its behavior and figure out what it's doing. Um, underwater drones are quite exciting. There's more and more underwater drones out there. Um, but I think the thing that, that really excites me is just that that you can buy a simple camera and be able to take it underwater now so easily and there's so much out there still to be discovered still to be explored and so I think what excites me the most is user generated content you know we can all get out there in our rock pools and and even be able to dive for, with a fairly cheap but good camera now and uh, and you know see the world for ourselves and find the next Percy all right. So Josh is tuning in with us. Josh is wondering, uh, for something like Blue Planet 2, how much was storyboarded ahead of time versus just coming together while you're in the field? It's a really good idea, actually. In fact, I was uh, doing some pre-editing today on a sequence that, that we've put together for Frozen Planet 2. Um, and about for that particular sequence, about half of it we ended up filming and the other half was serendipity. So I mean, we really do our homework before we head out in the field. We read every scientific paper we can get our hands on. We speak to the experts in the field and we try really hard to make sure we're in the right place at the right time with the right people. And we're there for the correct amount of time depending on how frequently an animal you know, does the behavior that, that we're expecting to. And of course, weather and everything else that can take up huge amounts of your shoot time. Um, Sometimes you get it pretty bang on, other times you, you can pretty much just rip up the piece of paper and you're just filming what's in front of you. Um, so yeah, I think if it's, if it's a fairly well-known behavior, then we can be quite prescriptive with the kind of kit and, uh, and the kind of shots we're going for. If it's something fairly unknown, then uh, yeah, you're just, like you said earlier, you're just winging it. <laughs> All right, very cool. So another question that came in, uh, people are wondering about your background. Did you have a film background or biology background? A biology background. So um, I studied biology at university and then I learned to become a dive master and a dive instructor and, um, and spent a lot of time guiding um, in Indonesia and the Philippines and in Australia before before I was so lucky and uh, and managed to meet a crew in Australia um, 10 years ago, which uh, at first I was what they called a tape monkey. And so I'd run around making teas and coffees for people and we'd, uh, we'd film back on tape then. See, just 10 years ago, we were still filming on tape and I'd grab the tapes and ingest them onto the system and make backups. So, um, but really, you don't have to have a, a background in biology at all. You just have to be really keen and have real passion for, for the topic that you want to make films about. And, um, and just be persistent like Percy, because, um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult industry to crack into. But, um, but if, if you really want it, then go for it. And, you know, or get in contact with me and I'll give you some tips. <laughs> All right. Amazing, Rachel. I think that's such a, I love that. That's such a good message. If you want something, you do have to go for it. I think many jobs people are passionate about have that kind of tape monkey stage and you have to push through it and, you know, kind of separates people, I think sometimes too. And yeah, incredible, incredible stories you shared with us today. Um, I can't wait to see what's coming down the pipe next. And it's always just a pleasure to steal some of your time and to host you for some of these sessions. Oh, thank you so much. And I look forward to, to watching the rest of the talks over the weekend. It's uh, You've got a fantastic set of speakers ahead. I think uh, it's lovely weather here in Bristol, but I think I'm going to be locked onto my laptop for half of it. <laughs> All right. Well, again, Rachel, thank you so much.